Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be back in Utah, and I can actually breathe now. The pollution in China is so bad that um, I think uh, tourism should uh, grow here very, very quickly. Uh, you have beautiful environment, and the air is great. And I'm going to have some pictures about um, some of the uh, problems with air pollution in China. It's a very, very serious problem. So I'm going to be, um, you can hear my voice is al already rasped. That's part of um, doing business in China. This is one of the side effects. So let me just say before I start, uh, thank you to Norm and his team for putting this together, and also President Holland, uh, who really has a vision of engagement with the community in different ways. And one of the engagement areas is to try to bring uh, people who have knowledge with respect to specialized areas like China <clears throat> and engage in the business community and uh, UV, UVU being a portal of knowledge to uh, the community. Now, I have two hours worth of slides and we don't have that much time. So I'm gonna hit on some key points because I'd really like to hear from you and answer your questions and also uh, give you some, some thoughts about international business. So there's new leadership in China right now. You have uh, the standing committee, <clears throat> which has been reduced from nine to seven. It makes it much more manageable. This is uh, President Xi Jinping, and his wife is actually a very uh, famous folk singer, uh, uh, Madam Peng. Uh, but I want to talk about one of his major initiatives. One of the major initiatives going on in China now is an anti-corruption ca uh, campaign. In 2012, they had uh, 160,000 cases, uh, recovering a lot of mon money. Uh, but actually, I mean, corruption happens in all countries, including the United States. You remember uh, Bernie Madoff. You remember um, some of this uh, big, what is Enron. Uh, so it happens here as well. But in China, uh, they're really trying to crack down on these bribes. And this guy is, uh, the new president is doing a very good job. 200,000 people in 2013 were convicted, 200,000. So he's really making a serious commitment to get, a, uh, get rid of uh, corruption as best he can. So let's uh, look at the world's largest human migration. I thought this would be interesting. There's a, how many people on the planet? Is it six or seven billion now? 3.6 billion journeys happened over the Chinese Spring Festival. Just put that in your mind. That's, that's the amount of people that travel in China over the uh, Chinese New Year. And this kind of gives the... Um, uh, the data, but that is a lot of people. That is not the time to try to buy a train ticket in China. Don't do it uh, during that, that period. Let's look about the economy. So the economy today in China uh, is number two in the world. Uh, you can see that five countries, there's about 200 nations in the world, five countries represent 53% of the world's GDP. You have US, China, Japan, Germany, and France. Those are the five. That's pretty amazing. The other 195 is the 47% that's remaining. So the largest economies, and what's amazing is if you look at 1990, USA was number one, China was 11. Go to 2010, and that's when China went from, to, from 11 to number two. Absolutely amazing rise, unprecedented in, uh, in uh, human history to see that type of growth in the economy. So GDP growth, this is one of those big debate areas. Uh, GDP growth is a, uh, how the economy is growing. In the United States, they just adjusted our GDP growth to 2.4%. Uh, In China, it grew this past year at 7.6%. Uh, now, that doesn't sound like much, but it is a lot uh, the, for the second largest economy in the world to grow at that, at that rate. I predict that in 2014, a lot of predictions that is it going to be it's going to be seven percent or less, but I think China is actually going to come in about eight eight point two percent to eight point three percent. I think they're going to better it. One of the ways they're going to uh, you, you'll see in the media that they're playing a little bit with the currency. Uh, we do things like quantitative easing. Our dollar was very very soft. When your dollar is soft, what happens is your exports are cheaper. So China just now devalued their currency just a little bit. It went from 6.05 renminbi to a dollar. Now it's about 6.14. So you'll, that means that Chinese exports will be cheaper, and that, that generates more revenue for China. So 
Uh, when you look at China from a PPP standpoint, purchasing price parity, it's almost very, very near the same as the United States. And kind of uh, uh, the big idea about uh, purchasing price parity is if you spend a dollar in the United States, you buy something for a dollar. If you bought, bought that same item in another country, what would you get? So here's a kind of a fun way to look at it. I usually use this as the Big Mac's index. So if you bought a Big Mac, I guess a $4.20 Big Mac in the US, in China that same meal, Big Mac meal, would cost $2.44. So what that is telling you is that the Chinese currency is undervalued. It should be revalued at a higher number. If you look at Switzerland at 681, it means that the Swiss uh, currency is overvalued. So this is kind of a fun way to look at it. They also do this with Starbucks. They have an index on Starbucks, and it just it gives you kind of an idea if a currency is undervalued or overvalued. For the first time in uh, history, um, uh, China overtook the US to become the world's largest trading country for the first time in 2013. China's combined annual exports and imports uh, totaled 4.16 trillion, and U.S. was 3.82. That's the first time that has happened. Just happened this past year. <clears throat> China's trade with the U.S. You can see here; uh, those are our exports. You can see they've grown actually pretty well. They grew a lot uh, again because the dollar was soft. That was part of it. And now uh, that's China's imports to the United States. So the trade imbalance is about 300 billion. But this is one of those political footballs as a lesson. So there's a lesson here. Political football is uh, the US government officials always say to the Chinese, look at that trade surplus. You guys are bad. You guys are just uh, uh, pushing too much stuff into our market. But if you really think about it, the chi China is not shipping product here from the country of China for themselves. Someone's buying that product and ordering it from China. So all of that trade uh, surplus is people like Walmart that uh, orders $30 billion worth of things out of China each year. So there's a customer at the other end of this, is my point. So it should really not be a political football. It's supply and demand. Uh, this is a very interesting chart. Uh, for 1985 was the only time when it was absolutely a perfect balance between exports and imports uh, from China to the U.S. And that ever since then, uh, China has uh, had a positive trade balance with us. Service value trade is important in that the service industries are growing in China. It's not just a factory and manufacturing, but actually service goods. Uh, CPI, which is a major gauge of inflation, uh, is at 1.5%, so they have inflation well under control. Very, very small inflation number. Debt, China and Japan own most of the U.S. debt, so they're financing our debt. Uh, you can see our U.S. Uh, debt was at uh, 17 trillion in February, and China had 1.4 trillion of our debt, and Japan 1.17. And this is the, the, the story I just told you on Chinese currency. So Chinese currency, right now is at 6.14. It actually just depreciated just a little bit. It was at 6.05 in January. And again, when you depreciate your currency, it makes your exports much cheaper. So I think the Chinese can throttle their currency. We do the same thing, even though we say we don't do it. We do the same thing with uh, techniques like quantitative easing. Uh, Chinese have more money in the bank than anyone uh, in the world, they have uh, 1.6 trillion. 80% of the world of uh, the U.S. GDP is in the bank. That's big numbers. So, it's a country that saves a lot of money. Another interesting data point is five banks in China control assets of nearly nine trillion dollars. All those banks are controlled by the government. They're state-owned enterprises, and that's 50% of China's financial assets with those five banks. And they merely only have uh, 1.6 million employees in the five banks. Foreign direct investment, this is a good indicator of people's confidence in a country. This is when you bring money from outside into China. So you can see uh, the value uh, has grown. You can see the growth rate. 
which is a good sign. It was uh, kind of flat for a while here, and now it just picked up in January uh, with new investments of, uh, uh, you can see the percentage growth rate of 16%. Now, this is very important and has an implication to Utah. So the implication is if you look at ODI and right here, that's outbound direct investment, and FDI is foreign direct investment. That's money going into China. But you can see the growth here of China money going outside of China. Now, uh, I can tell you that there is a high interest in China to invest outside of China. And you'll see in the next few years, even here in the state of Utah, more Chinese investments coming in here. There are some barriers. Uh, as an individual, if I was in China, I can only take out $50,000. And there's limits uh, that the Chinese government puts on you. And they control all of this through an organization called SAFE, State Administration for Foreign Exchange. Once that is lifted, that barrier is lifted, you're going to see a lot of investments because, for example, I had a friend uh, from China, a chairman of a company, and I was taking him in Honolulu. We were uh, going down a very nice street, and there was a beautiful home. The home on the street was uh, $3.5 million, a uh, very nice home. And I told him, you know, you can get this home for $3.5 million, and he couldn't believe how cheap it was because in China, an apartment, apartment building, of a high level, in other words, high quality, cost 120,000 renminbi per square meter. What does that mean? 120,000 renminbi is 612, that's uh, $20,000. For 100 square meters, $20,000, that's $2 million for 100 square meters. 100 square meters is 1,000 square feet in an apartment in China for $2 million, and guess what? You don't own the land. It's leasehold. Only the government of China owns the land. So when I said, by the way, if you buy this $3.5 million house, you actually own the land, he could not believe it. He said, I own the land? I can buy this? I can own the land? So that's going to happen in Utah, because Utah prices on housing is, a, is very much cheaper than some of the places in Honolulu. In Honolulu, for $600,000, you might be able to buy a garage. I mean, it's really not uh, very, very good in terms of uh, housing costs. So you're going to see an implication to Utah is money's going to flow here. And they're going to look at Utah clean air. Uh, well, you have five federal uh, uh, parks, beautiful federal parks. You have uh, wonderful outdoor activities. And they, they, they're going to want that. They're going to thrive on that. Where's the money going? Mostly it goes to energy. Uh, this is where... Uh, M&As are happening in China. I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, imports, uh, China imports almost all its soybeans. So if you were a soybean farmer in Utah, you could absolutely sell to China. They have a hunger for soybeans. These are some of the deals that are going on, and these are strategic deals, most of them. Uh, Chinese tend to buy revenue-producing assets or things that have a strategic purpose. So this is food deals. And if you look at uh, things like related to milk, one of the reasons that Chinese are importing a lot of milk into China is because they had the melamine scare. Do you remember that? Where there was poison in the milk, that someone spiked the milk. So I can tell you, most of my Chinese friends don't trust the milk. It was, a, it was unfortunate that a few people made it uh, scary for a lot of people, but 400,000 individuals were affected by that. I'm just going to flip through some of this. Now, I want to go to this for example. This is an example of what could happen in Utah and other parts of the United States. So the London example. In 2012, money that came out of China to buy real estate assets in London was $88 million. In 2013, the entire year was $1.4 billion. And just in January alone, China moved $3.2 billion into the London market. And what's interesting is not only did they buy offices and retail and hotels, uh, hotel developments, mix, mixed-use developments, they also now are developing projects. Now, that's unusual. China usually buys revenue-producing pro uh, projects. This time, they're actually buying land and then developing the land themselves. And this is the example of what they did. Uh, I'll give you this one, the famous Crystal Palace. I think that was in the World's Fair of 1851. 
Uh, they uh, purchased it, and now they're redeveloping that whole area. And they have uh, on the river uh, Th Thames, they have uh, a big development going on. And then China just bought an ownership in Sunseeker Yachts, and that's because there's a lot of wealthy people uh, uh, growing up in China right now. There's about 25% um, of the Chinese population is uh, middle class, but 25% of the population of China is equal to the entire population of the United States, just to put it into, into perspective. And about 20% are affluent now. There's over 350 billionaires in China, and if the, the official number is 350, it means there's probably 1,000. And the millionaires, there's the reported number is 1.5, uh, 1,500,000 millionaires, which means there's probably 10 million, 10 million millionaires, because a lot of people try to dis, uh, disperse their money so you can't really see their assets. Now I want to talk about the air I, I told you before. This is the official chart. Does everybody know the 2.5 p.m. count, particulate matter? You've heard about that, right? So normally, most cities are zero to 50 in the United States. It means uh, air, air quality is good. Uh, 51 to 100 is moderate. So sometimes maybe at the uh, foot of the mountain, you might get an inversion. It might get up there to the 50 uh, number uh, if you had an inversion. But um, if you get down to these numbers, where you have one, 105 to 150, it's uh, unhealthy for people who have sensitive. If you had bronchitis or uh, asthma, uh, you'd have issues. If you get here, it's unhealthy. 300 is hazardous. If we had a 300 number in the United States, they close the schools, they close all the federal buildings, and they would tell everybody, don't go out and stay home. This is what it was in China two weeks ago. No one's ever saw, seen a number like this, 999. Remember, 300 is hazardous. 999. I wear masks. If you hear my voice raspy in my, in my jacket over there, I have a mask that goes from zero to 300. And then I have another mask that looks something like Darth Vader that goes from 300 and above. It is bad. And this is going to change uh, a lot of people's thoughts about China. In fact, in Beijing, the tourism numbers are going down. Tourism numbers are going down. It is frightening, uh, this pollution. It's, and guess what? The government can't control it, and the government can't get rid of it. We had the same situation in the United States, not as bad, but bad in Los Angeles in the 1960s and 70s. And then the California government put all new environmental laws in, like catalytic converters on cars. The California cars had to be certified differently. They cut uh, a lot of the uh, power stations. They shut down. So uh, China's got to have to take some drastic action. Now, when you look at this negative, if you're in health care, I can tell you there's a big market in China coming. Think about the young people who are breathing this air now. Uh, asthma, if you had an asthma solution or, uh, I mean, there's going to be big industry. It's unfortunate that the young people in China have to go through this today because there's going to be severe health problems as they get older. This is what Beijing looks like. This is from NASA, a NASA satellite. You can see Beijing here, and you can see Tianjin. You can see clearly see the coastline here from NASA. That's without pollution. That's a clear day. That's what it looks like with the pollution. Same, you can't even see uh, Beijing and Tianjin. When I look out the window of my office, which is 90% of the time there's pollution, it just looks I'm at, like I'm in a gray cloud, but it's actually pollution. It's very, very bad. This is the CCTV tower. You can kind of see the haze there. That's probably a 400, uh, 400 day. This is, can you see the police officer here and the cars in the back? It looks like everybody's in a fog. Very dangerous when you drive, you can't even see. This is normal now, all across China, people wearing masks. And this is not in just one city. This is in many cities. Serious problem. You can kind of see the sun up there during the day. So there's other cities in China that are taking advantage of now creating eco-cities, and they're trying to say, my city is clean, and I think they're doing a good job at that. This is one city that I wanted to show as an example that actually kicked out three, uh, uh, two, 234 
chemical plants. They closed a bunch of plants. And now 40% of the city is green, the downtown of the city. And they've now allocated 20% uh, 20 of the city as open land that nobody can build on. So there's actually some Chinese leadership that are being aggressive about creating eco centers. On the military, this is their first carrier, uh, the Liaoning. Uh, that's recycled from the Ukraine. They bought a Ukraine ship and then made it into a carrier. Uh, I wanted to just touch on military spending because this is one of those political footballs. The United States, uh, the, the world market or the world total for uh, uh, military spending is about 1.7 trillion. Uh, half of it, half of it uh, is spent by the United States, about half. And China's here. So uh, when the political football comes in, I usually talk about China in the favorable way. China is building up their military. They need to. They want to defend themselves just like when we built up our, our military. But I try to make the example that if you look at the neighbors of China, who's by them? I'm not saying any of these neighbors are bad. I'm not making judgments. But if you look at the neighbors, who are the neighbors of China? You have North Korea. You have Pakistan. You have Russia. You have India. I mean, in that whole neighborhood, you have nuclear nations that have nuclear weapons. So in the China, and you have Russia. And Russia has known to kind of make call, uh, uh, visits to the, their neighborhoods, people around their neighborhood from time to time. So when you look at the United States, should we worry about Bermuda or Mexico or Canada? So our neighborhood is pretty good. The Chinese neighborhood, they're concerned about their neighbors. So that's one of the reasons they want to increase their military. But if you go to Chinese philosophy, which is very important, Confucianism, talks about a benevolent society. Chinese are not aggressors. They are benevolent people. It's part of the culture. It's part of Confucius thinking. So they're not aggressors. China was aggressive to itself as it developed into one nation. But really, they don't try to go out and conquer the world. And there's some uh, nations around them that have done that. And they're doing more and more. China's trying to engage. Uh, just like UVU, engage in military exercises. So in November, uh, they actually did something in Hawaii, and they've done all these type of drills hand-in-hand -hand with a lot of other nations. And for the first time, they will come to Hawaii, the biggest, lo world's largest international maritime warfare exercise happens off the coast of Hawaii. It's called RIMPAC, and this will be the first time that China comes to that. That's where you actually work together and also check out each other's capabilities. Everybody's looking at each other. Are these guys good? Are they well trained? Uh, so it's going kind to of be an interesting time. And 22 nations will participate. Number of college graduates in China growing uh, each year. Uh, 2014, I think it's estimated at 7.2 uh, million graduates. You know what the number is, Norm, in the US? I should get that number. I think it's a lot smaller. A uh, lot of joint venture universities going on in China. Uh, but this is interesting. Uh, this is relevant to UVU. Um, there was a, a very major decision made uh, by someone that I've actually had the honor and privilege to meet personally, uh, President Thomas Monson, and where young ladies and young men are, can go out on mission a lot earlier. And that has kind of changed the landscape of people coming into school. Uh, so they could, can go out on mission a little bit earlier. Uh, so this relates to that in this way, is that a lot of Chinese students go abroad for study. And this is a wonderful institution for them to come to, UVU. Wonderful. Uh, uh, wonderful people, wonderful infrastructure, and one of wonderful teachers and uh, administration. So. If you look at the number, 235,000 Chinese students studied in the United States this past year, 2012, 2013. So more of them should, should find Utah. Uh, this is a place, uh, I'm not telling you, I'm not saying that all 235,000 should come to Utah. And I'm not saying uh, too many, I know there's a, a, a room issue here at UVU, but it's good to have an international mix. The more international mix you have with people, is good. It's also good for uh, creating understanding. When people go to school together, break bread together, play sports together, do things together, they tend not to kill each other in the future. So the more international cooperation we have, the better it is. 
And one of my philosophies, philosophies in business is world peace through world trade. The more that people trade together, work together, make money from each other, and have economic benefit, they tend not to kill each other either. So world peace through world, world trade is also a good thing. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this. This is kind of uh, the growth, number of students studying abroad. But let's, let's look at what's gonna happen in China 2014 and beyond. So China, kind of get in your mind that China has shifted from a world factory to a world market. What does that mean? It means that there's purchasing power in China. People buy stuff. And our economy in the United States, I think the, the last time I looked, 70% of the US con economy is driven by domestic consumption. China's economy has been driven up until recently through exports. So now they're shifting to domestic consumption because what happens in exports? If there's a financial crisis, your whole system falls apart. So you need the domestic consumption. One of the ways they're doing that is through urbanization. And I'm gonna show you some interesting data points. So China's urbanization. For the first time in Chinese history, Chinese history is 5,000 years old, so it's not a short history. For the first time in history, you can see the rural was less, 48% in the rural, that's the population, and 52% in cities. That has never happened before in China. The largest human migration in history in China has occurred over the last 20 years. 400 million people have moved from the rural areas into the cities. That's a huge, just, just think of this, the entire <clears throat> United States moving. That's, that's the kind of scale that we're talking about. Now, why is that important to domestic consumption? Is because when you're in a city, you tend not to be in the country. There's a lot of shopping, there's a lot of infrastructure, so it's easier, easier to shop. That's kind of the mix. Uh, retail sales, uh, just to prove the point, uh, retail sales was $2.16 trillion in China. That is huge and growing. China is the world's second largest luxury market in the world. Second largest luxury market. So if you like Hermes and Gucci and Chanel and Mercedes and Audi and all the luxury brands, China is gonna be number one this year. By the end of this year, it'll be the number one luxury market in the world. And in fact, if you like handbags, uh, and my friend, where's my friend Mickey, is she here? She left, okay, she likes handbags. But in any, any case, 25% of Louis Vuitton Mo Moet Hennessy sales come out of China now. So Vuitton is very, very big. And I'm gonna show you a couple examples of that. Uh, why, what empowers people to do that? In part, what empowers people to do that is you need a credit card. And Chinese, on an average, have three credit cards per person. Bank cards and debit cards. So this kind of gives you this, the scale. You need that in order to transact. Now why is that uh, unusual? Is the Chinese typically paid for the whole history, everything in cash. Chinese are not used to plastic. So this is a big, big different trend, and these are the younger Chinese in particular. So you can see that uh, the growth of debit cards and credit cards is growing in China, and that also feeds uh, the retail industry. Okay, how many minutes? Is it 12? Okay, I'm gonna try to finish so I can answer some questions. So I'm gonna flash through this, show you a couple, these are the billionaires, but I wanted to show you some pictures of people shopping. Um, so this is, uh, by 2017, 20% of the Chinese population will be affluent. That's 300 million people. This is a Vuitton store. Uh, this was a, a, a big promo that they just did in uh, Shanghai. Uh, this is the Shanghai store. It's a huge store, uh, Vuitton, the, one of the large, I think it's their largest store in the world now. This is the outside at night. This is the line waiting to get in to shop for those cheap Louis Vuitton bags. These are a few aggressive shoppers trying to get the right model. This is the Mont Blanc store. I think Norm, didn't I take, well, then we went there, right? So when, when uh, Nor, uh, Dean Wright was in, in China, we went over to the store. It's the largest Mont Blanc store in the world that's six stories high. This is what it looks like on the inside. 
wine is going up in China like crazy, wine sales. And I think I'll end on this note. Uh, uh, China becomes the biggest market for red wine with 1.86 billion bottles sold in 2013. Red wine is important because red, as a color, uh, Chinese like the color red. It means luck. If you look at there, it represents good fortune, strength, and luck. So red is good. Uh, outdoor wear growing in China like crazy, uh, which is a nice fit for Utah. These are some uh, Columbia sportswear is doing very well. Uh, Vanity Fair, they're counting their whole future on China. If you look at the revenues they're anticipating uh, between 2012 and 2017, a lot of people are moving there, meaning there's a market in China. So when you think about China, think about maybe selling something in China, and then your incremental volume goes back to the United States. Incremental volume means that you get all the volume in China, it makes your cost of goods coming back to the United States less. This is the Apple Store. Maybe I'll end on the Apple Store story. So in the Apple Store in China, there were four Apple Stores that were completely counterfeit, the entire store including the product in the store, except the employees, they thought they worked for Apple. So when they closed the stores, the, the, actually the employees, I saw one store closed, they were crying because they actually thought they worked for Apple. But the store was counterfeit and the product was counterfeit and China ha has cracked down on that. This is a real Apple store in San Li Tun and it's always busy. This is in the evening, everybody's always there. And just to give you an idea of the sales, Apple sold in 2012, I couldn't get their recent number, they sold $24 billion worth of Apple products into the China market, 24 billion. So it's a very, very lucrative market, except the Sam Samsung Galaxy is now beating out Apple. The Chinese like Samsung much better than Apple right now. So Apple's under pressure. And I'll finish, let me see if I can get to the end. This is also very good uh, uh, growth of uh, Tencent. Now, if you want to look at what the, that means, is Tencent that owns QQ and WeChat, that's the number of monthly users they have, 1.108 billion. Facebook has 1.19 billion. In three months from now, they will pass Facebook in China with the number of users. They've grown faster than Facebook and they're gonna pass Facebook. Let me see if I can get here to the end. That's another interesting picture. That's Ikea. Everyone loves Ikea. There are a lot of people that buy these apartments. They need to, to furnish them. So Ikea is always busy. McDonald's uh, uh, Coke is expanding. Uh, great confidence in the market. McDonald's is growing. But I want to show you a cool thing on McDonald's. When I order McDonald's, as soon as I call in the order or I do it online, it registers your order. And then it says it will be there in 26 minutes, whatever the delivery time is. And then you can watch on your computer that your order's in progress. It says it's in progress. Then you can say it's in delivery. You can actually see these things come up on your computer or on your mobile phone app. And then when it says delivery and it says delivered and a click goes on, as when that hits, that click, someone's knocking at my door. It is amazing. They have this online system that you can track the orders. I'm going to finish with a project that I just did. We'll get out of this. That's the traffic. Maybe just stop here to show you how many cars were sold. First time in history, 20 million cars were sold in China. In the United States, we sold 15.6. And the number would probably be 40 million if they didn't restrict the number of license plates. They're restricting the number of license plates now. This was just uh, at the San Li Tun area where the, uh, this was a beautiful display. I just uh, love the display. They really did a great job. Here are the top brands. You can see Audi. Almost 500,000 Audis are sold in China. Number one uh, market for Audi. And by the end of this year, number one market for Mercedes. And definitely the number one market for Volkswagen. Get here to the very end. Oh, this I think is important too. Uh, last year, 100 million Chinese traveled abor abroad. It's the largest traveling audience in the world. You Utah can take advantage of that. 
They haven't discovered Utah yet. And one of the things I said uh, yesterday in Salt Lake, one thing has to change. Write Governor Herbert and tell him to have, do a, a good job negotiating and getting one, a nonstop flight from China to here. As soon as you have a nonstop flight from China to here, then you're gonna see kids go to school here, you're gonna see investment here, and you're gonna see Chinese taking advantage of your beautiful five federal parks and, and your beautiful assets. And they, Chinese now have a, a expression, the people who interact with the Chinese shoppers, they call them walking wallets. They're walking wallets because they spend $7,500 a day, uh, typically when they visit the US. And I, as an example, in Hawaii, where I live, just in the last few months, three airlines are now flying nonstop from China to Hawaii. That's going to change the tourism picture in Hawaii big time. Hawaiian Airlines will start flying in September. Let's see if I can get here to the end. Powder milk, I mentioned that's growing. The imports is crazy, again, because of safety issues. This is an interesting picture of books. You can rent books with your bus pass uh, when you're walking around the city. This is a kiosk. They have them all over the city in Beijing. You take the book, you rent it, and then when you're done, you put it back in the opening here, and you're done with it. Fantastic. This is the rental bike. You take your bus pass or even a phone app. You put it there, and you can take a bike all over the city. You just take it out of the rack, and you can ride around. This is someone who's just doing that. But notice, notice she has a mask on. These are their high-speed trains that go 301 kilometers an hour, hour on an average. Fantastic train system. And this is a project that I just finished up. This is the chairman of a big company called China National Coal. This is the chairman of the manufacturing arm in my office in Beijing. This is a negotiation which is typical, one against 10. As you can see me negotiating there, that was for a joint venture. This is the signing of the intellectual property agreement. This is the signing of the joint venture. This is an actual license, because people say sometimes you can't get information, but it's, that's, you can see my name right there as the license holder for the joint venture. This is when, after we built the joint venture, I showed this last year here at the event. I just wanted to give you an update. That's what it looked like last year when I uh, uh, inked the deal. This is the steel going up. This is the inspection uh, when we were building the building. This is, I'll give you a scale, that's a, uh, a uh, cement truck right there to give you the size of it. These are 350,000 square feet each factory. This is what it looks like empty when it was completed. Remember this green line? This is what it looks like full with equipment. These are uh, uh, CNC, uh, com com uh, numerical controlled, computer numerical controlled equipment. Millions and millions of dollars of equipment. State of the art from Germany, Japan, USA. This is another look of that floor that you saw empty. Now it's full manufacturing. This is one of the pieces of equipment that are one of the more expensive uh, CNC machines. This is the front of the building, which is the um, office. These are the products that we make that clean coal, clean coal technology. This is where the clean coal technology goes into these kinds of plants. We've supplied the plant. And that's the end of my presentation. I'll take some questions now. It's, it's hard to go through China in 20 or 30 minutes. But we covered a lot of ground, and I didn't show you all the slides there. In fact, when I edited this, I took out 100 slides. There's 100 more slides that you didn't see. But you should get a sense that China's on the move. It's moving forward. It's uh, uh, projections that it will be the number one economy in the next few years just because of their size. Uh, but it is a miracle what has happened there. Not good, not great, but 300 million people, as another data point, have been taken out of absolute pro poverty in China because of Deng Xiaoping's idea of one country, two systems. One country, China, two systems, capitalism and socialism mixed together, and that cocktail nobody thought would work, and guess what, it has worked well. 
So some questions. And I have a rule. If you don't ask a question, I ask you questions. So yes, please. I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> now, uh, actually, China uh, has a policy that from fifth grade on, you take English. It's, one, it's a requirement. Uh, language is becoming less and less a barrier. So if you go to man, many of the cities, m a lot of the younger population speaks English. Older population, less English. But there's an abundance of schools uh, English schools that have been established in China, and that's a big area. One of the advantages of UVU, it has its own, it's ESL program, right? ESL, where people can come here and learn English. If they learn English, they get up to a certain level. They can then uh, uh, move right into the university community. So a big opportunity in languages in China. A lot of private schools and so forth. Other questions? Yes. Well, that's a, a great question. The question is, why do so many students want to go abroad? Actually, there's a test in China called the Gaokao. The Gaokao is the national exam. It happens usually the first week of June. A lot of pressure on a lot of students, especially now when there's a one-child policy. But now that actually has changed a little bit. But uh, about 10 million people take the exam, the Gaokao. Only 5 million get into the schools. So five million either go to vocational schools or they look, they go into the workforce or they look to study abroad. So the system in China can't accept everybody who takes the national exam. They only take, if you're 50% and above, they take it, so that's why. Also, there's another reason. The other reason is that Chinese parents feel if their kids can have an international education, both in China and the US or abroad, they will have a competitive advantage when they get a job going back in China because they have more international experience. A lot of the parents feel strongly about that, and I agree with them. Other questions? Yes. It has just changed. Actually, there was a big uh, meeting that they had, and if you're, if you, if say you, there's a husband and wife, and one of the, the husband or wife is from a one-child family, they're the one child, then they're allowed to have two kids now. So that's a big shift. And actually, you, you think there'd be, everyone would be in favor of it, but there's a lot of Chinese that are against that. And if you actually look at the statistics from two, uh, uh, 1979 till now, when they changed the policy, uh, there would have been 400 million more Chinese born in that 30-year period uh, because if they didn't have a one-child policy. And the reason China did that, it sounded very cruel to the Western world, but the Chinese are very smart. They figured out that they can't support the population with food and water and infrastructure if, if they just have unlimited growth. Like India, you'll see that India has bigger problems because they don't have a throttle on growth. I'm not saying any, India is doing anything wrong, but I think India will have some issues because their population will surpass uh, China in the very near future. But that's, what, that, that's the big policy change. Yeah, if you're a woman, a husband or wife, and you're a one child, you can have a second child. Sometimes uh, uh, we look at that differently, but I think it was actually the right, the right decision of the time. Yes? I just wanted to know a little bit more about the role maybe China might play. Sure. Uh, what's the main benefits? Good, good question, and I'm happy to talk about it, because that I think is very successful. <clears throat> Uh, first of all, when you do a joint venture, a joint venture means that there should be, and these are some of these economic uh, lessons, but there should be mutual benefit. What's the benefit to China? China got a technology from the number one market leader in the United States for clean coal technology. The second thing they did is they got management uh, techniques from the U.S. that are being brought over, and they share in the revenue of the, of the joint venture. So, but what was difficult about the deal, these are the difficult parts, is when you work with state-owned enterprises in China, those are the biggest corporations in China. The, the, they're, they are the corporations on ster steroids. They're huge. So it's hard to, to dictate uh, what you want and get it. You have to really uh, know what you're doing. So in this deal, where the, the American side is 51% owner and Chinese are 49. So that's huge. 
number one. Number two, I was able to get the China side, China coal, to guarantee that they would purchase 50% of the production up front, which means that if they purchased 50% of the production before we invested dollar one, we already knew we were gonna make money. That took care of everything. The third thing is that the legal representative of the company is myself. The legal representative is the person who signs all, all the different, um, let's see if we go back, well, that signs all the different documents. I think it's on that license. I, pointed it out before, but that is very, very important because you, you want to have control, uh, and the Chinese, this is where, that's the license holder of the joint venture, that's my name, and that's the legal representative, so that's the person who can sign the deal. So the, the Chinese wanted the technology, and this is also a good example for intellectual property. China has a bad reputation. People say, oh, they steal everything. It's not true. China doesn't steal everything. They don't have to steal. In fact, the Chinese are developing a lot of technology themselves, and they're worried about the Americans stealing their technology. I mean, the blade cuts in both directions. So in this deal, they could have taken these centrifuges and screens and copied them, but they, they wanted to do it the right way. They came to the best company in the United States. They paid for the technology. We have an intellectual property agreement where they pay a royalty, and it's straight up. So one of the things when I talk about IP, the way you protect IP, you can do it through legal agreements, but that's actually, in my opinion, secondary. What's most important is you have to pick the right partner. And if your partner shares in the economic benefit of the deal, guess what happens? If someone attacks that deal, both parties are losing, and guess who's gonna win? That Chinese who's your partner is gonna fight whoever's stealing. And I would rather have a China partner fighting a China person who's uh, infringing on our technology than an American trying to fi fight a Chinese partner, that ain't, that's not going to work too well. So a partner is everything. How much time do we have? Okay. Thank you for putting limits on me already. Okay. Was there any other questions? Yes. Well, I, I make a, a good question, but I, I make a joke. I've been going to China for 34 years. I still have not found, I haven't found any communists. All I find is capitalists. I could be in the middle of a farm, and the first thing the guy says to me is, you think you can export this crop for me? We're ready to make a deal. So the Chinese blood is about capitalism. Uh, uh, communism, we have distorted the picture of communism. Communism, it only means it's one party. The one party is the Communist Party. The leader of the Communist Party is chosen by the party, just like in Japan chooses its leader, just like Australia chooses its leader, just like England chooses its leader. There's no open election. There's no general election. They choose a leader. So the point is, communism is a one party, but in that party, the Communist Party today, there are a hundred different uh, factions that are fighting whether it's women issues, whether it's minority issues, all the issues are fought in the party. Now, I want to tell you, and I'll conclude on this note, in the U.S., we have Democrats, Republicans, and Independents. Guess what happens? When there's a problem, the Republicans blame the Democrats, the Democrats blame the Republicans. Everybody does this. In China, they have the burden of being one party. That means they have to get it right or they're going to be extinct in the future. They have a great burden. They can't point the finger at someone else. There's only one party. So I just think about that a little bit. They have a grave responsibility to deliver. If they don't deliver, uh, they're in trouble for the future, and they know that. Thank you very much. I can feel Norm's energy here. And I'll, I'll be around for a while, so I'll be happy to answer any, any other uh, questions.